Well, Lindsey Graham goes on TV after dinner, and presumably whatever he drinks and has with dinner, there's a very good chance he's going to cry. You need to help this man, Donald J. Trump. They're trying to drain him dry. He spent more money on lawyers than most people spend on campaigns. They're trying to bleed him dry. Donald J. Trump.com. Go tonight. Give the president some money to fight this bullshit. I'm sorry I'm so upset, but please help President Trump. If you can fi afford five or ten bucks, if you can't afford a dollar, fine. Just pray. Lindsey Graham is crying and begging for money for a man who said this when he began running for president against Lindsey Graham and other Republicans. I don't need anybody's money. I'm using my own money. I'm not using the lobbyists. I'm not using donors. I don't care. That was a foundational lie of the Trump political career. Trump claimed to be so rich that he would never need any contributions at all, and therefore he would be incorruptible. And now Donald Trump is the most corrupt president in history, and he has taken more money out of the pockets of his supporters than any other president in history after first telling his supporters he didn't need their money. That's the person Lindsey Graham is crying for now. Lindsey Graham has never cried for a single child who has been murdered in a classroom in America. Not one. Lindsey Graham did not go on TV to cry for nine-year-old Evelyn Dykhouse, nine-year-old William Kinney, nine-year-old Allie Scruggs, who were murdered in a Nashville elementary school last week by a mass murderer who also killed Catherine Kuntz, the head of the school, Cynthia Peek, a substitute teacher, and Mike Hill, the school's custodian. Lindsey Graham did not shed a single tear for any one of those victims of America's latest mass murderer who used an AR-15 to fire 152 bullets in that school. After that mass murder, Lindsey Graham proudly told reporters in Washington that he owns an AR-15. He didn't say why. He didn't cry while casually talking to Washington reporters in the Senate hallway about America's latest mass murder. And he won't cry the next time. If your child's body is ripped apart by an AR-15 in your child's classroom, Lindsey Graham will not cry for your child, and he will not cry for you. He cried for one of Donald Trump's nominees to the United States Supreme Court when that nominee had an uncomfortable day in a Senate confirmation hearing. Lindsey Graham cried for him. Lindsey Graham got hysterical for him. And when that Supreme Court justice, for the first time in the history of the Supreme Court, voted to revoke a constitutional right from the women of this country and forced a 10-year-old pregnant girl to leave her state of Ohio to obtain urgently needed abortion services, Lindsey Graham did not cry. Lindsey Graham didn't cry about the rape of that 10-year-old girl, and he did not cry about what was forced upon her after the rape by the Supreme Court that Lindsey Graham voted into place. Professional Republicans absolutely do not cry for dead American children when they are murdered by AR-15s. Here is Tennessee Republican State Representative William Lamberth speaking to student protesters in Nashville who have spontaneously been demonstrating at the state capitol in the aftermath of the latest mass murder there. So you're not going to like my answer. And look, I'm going to say that straight up. It's not about this one gun. If there is a firearm out there that you're comfortable being shot with, please show me which one it is. There's not. Every, there's not. There's not. Right there. Every single gun in the hands of a crazy person, a deranged person, a convicted felon, every single right, weapon what out there. Are you going to be more scared be. when somebody's walking on the street with a giant ass gun for no reason? Like, nobody's going to do good with that gun. I understand that. The goal is not to get. But it's not, you could ban that specific gun, and you were going to do almost nothing to improve y'all's safety. That's I'm sorry, true. that's a fact. What what did you say? Say? I'm sorry, that's not a fact. The Washington Post has been reporting extensively on the unique damage to the human body done by AR-15s, which produce exit wounds much larger than the entrance wound of the bullet, because the bullet is designed 
to pass through the body in a way that expands the size of the wound and the damage as the bullet passes through the body. An emergency room doctor in Uvalde, Texas, described how unrecognizable some of the dead children were there because of what an AR-15 did to them. Some of the children had to be identified only by their clothing. Children in classrooms in America have literally had their heads blown off by AR-15s. So yes, the AR-15 does make a difference. Banning the sale of AR-15s would make a difference. Some children might have survived some of the gunshot wounds they suffered in schools around the country if the shooter had a less powerful gun. 152 bullets were fired from that AR-15 in that Nashville school last week. 152. A weapon not designed for war and for mass murder, as the AR-15 was, might only have allowed that shooter to get off a few dozen shots, maybe half as many shots. We don't know. We do know that 400 Texas police officers were afraid to enter a classroom where children were dying for 77 minutes because they were afraid of the AR-15 inside that classroom. What Republican State Representative William Lamberth and Lindsey Graham have in common with every other elected Republican in Washington is the absolute determination to make sure that every mass murderer who walks into an American school will be able to legally purchase an AR-15 to bring into that school with them. Elected Republicans are dedicated to making sure that America's mass murderers are the very best equipped mass murderers in the world. He landed at LaGuardia Airport, which is named for Fiorello LaGuardia, the first mayor of New York to serve 12 years in office. The next day, he rode to his arrest and arraignment in Lower Manhattan on FDR Drive, the most famous urban highway in America, named for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a New Yorker who was the only president elected four times to the presidency before term limits were imposed by constitutional amendment. On his way to plead not guilty, to a 34-count indictment approved by a Manhattan grand jury, he passed two federal courthouses, both named for New Yorkers. The Thurgood Marshall United States Courthouse, named for Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, who did his most important work as a civil rights lawyer while living in Harlem and running the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. The other was the Daniel Patrick Moynihan United States Courthouse, named for a New Yorker who served 24 years in the United States Senate. The glorious new addition to Penn Station on the west side of Manhattan is also named for Senator Moynihan. It is a short walk away from the Javits Center, a massive convention center named for Jacob Javits, who served 24 years in the United States Senate as a liberal Republican back when there was such a thing as a liberal Republican. The Javits Center is next door to the Lincoln Tunnel, one of the miracles of American infrastructure when it was completed in 1937 under the Hudson River, the Lincoln Tunnel, of course, named for President Abraham Lincoln. And it took some of the load off the spectacular George Washington Bridge, which crosses the Hudson River near Grant's tomb in Manhattan, a monument to President Ulysses S. Grant. As he rode back up FDR Drive after pleading not guilty, Donald Trump could gaze out the window at a magnificent monument to Franklin Delano Roosevelt that was built just a few years ago on Roosevelt Island in the East River. New York City is willing to change the names of important things in order to honor people who deserve such an honor. The name of New York City's largest international airport was changed to honor President John F. Kennedy after he was assassinated. And the name of the bridge Donald Trump drove across to and from LaGuardia Airport was changed recently to honor JFK's younger brother, Robert F. Kennedy, a New York senator, who was assassinated in 1968 while running for president. 
Donald Trump knows that his hometown will never change the name of anything for him. The name Trump will never be honored in New York City. The name Trump in New York City, to borrow a phrase from FDR, will live in infamy. And Donald Trump knows it. And New York City proved it again yesterday when the protesters Donald Trump summoned to the courthouse to protest his arrest did not show up. It was a tiny turnout. By my count, walking among the crowd of Trump supporters, there were maybe 100 to 120 of them, not always easy to distinguish them from the news media near them. Donald Trump won only 12 percent of the vote in Manhattan in the last presidential election. But that's 85,185 votes in Manhattan. That means there were thousands of Trump voters who live within walking distance of the courthouse. Donald Trump couldn't get 1 percent of the people who voted for him in Manhattan to walk down to the courthouse or take the subway. Donald Trump understandably wants to move his trial to Staten Island to, to cross the, the, the harbor on a ferry ride to Staten Island because he won Staten Island in the last election. Staten Island is the only Republican section of New York City, and Donald Trump won 123,320 votes in Staten Island, and not 1 percent of the people who voted for him in Staten Island were willing to take a ferry ride over to the courthouse for Donald Trump. Donald Trump's biggest vote count in New York City was in his old neighborhood of Queens, where he got 212,665 votes. And it's possible that no one from Queens bothered to go to the courthouse, because that's how tiny the crowd for Donald Trump was. In New York City, Donald Trump got 691,682 votes. And at the courthouse yesterday, he got dozens of people. It was, as chance would have it, the single most beautiful day of the year, 2023, in New York City so far. The warmest, sunniest day of the year, and the anti-Trump protesters at the courthouse thought that wasn't a coincidence. That's one of the pictures I took among the anti-Trump crowd, which was at least as big as the Trump supporting crowd. Donald Trump called for death and destruction yesterday. And he didn't get it. It was a huge win for democracy last night in Wisconsin. Wisconsin voters have made their voices heard. Yeah. Yeah. They've chosen to reject partisan extremism in this state. And second, it means our democracy will always prevail. Yeah. Our state is taking a step forward to a better and brighter future where our rights and freedoms will be protected. The Wisconsin Supreme Court was the only court in the country that actually considered overturning the last presidential election last night in a decisive 11 point victory. Milwaukee. County Judge Janet Protasewicz won a seat on the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, beating extremist Dan Kelly. This flips the court from an extremist right-wing Trump-supporting court to a sane court. Some might say a liberal court for the first time in 15 years. Sanity now has a four to three majority on that court, which could be making crucial decisions for the state on abortion rights, gerrymandered legislative districts, and possibly the outcome of the 2024 presidential election. Today, Ben Wickler, chair of the state Democratic Party, tweeted this election was a release valve for 12 years of Democratic rage in Wisconsin about Republicans rigging our state and smashing our democracy and then using that power to rip away our rights. In the winner's circle tonight, Ben Wickler, chair of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it must feel like uh, a, an amazing place to be. Uh, 11 points. Uh, I know I had a feeling, uh, based on some of the public things you said before the election, that you were confident. But uh, I didn't sense 11 points of confidence. 
No, this was a voter uprising. This was a state that has suffered through blow after blow after blow. The, the smashing of unions, the ripping apart of voting rights, the gerrymandering of districts, and then re-gerrymandering, unlike anywhere else in the country, by the Supreme Court. Even after we elected a governor who ran on a promise of fair maps, the Supreme Court just went around voters and chose the most partisan gerrymander in the United States. But last night, voters cast their final ballots and said absolutely no more. And today we're waking up in a state that has a, a path forward to actually become a legitimate functioning democracy. My eight-year-old daughter will cast a ballot for president in 2032 while Janet Protasiewicz sits on the Wisconsin State Supreme Court and safeguards the promise that when voters choose their leaders, those leaders stay chosen. Uh, were abortion rights the principal issue here? Abortion rights were the most powerful issue in this race and were linked inextricably to these questions around democracy. Wisconsin has an abortion ban that was passed 174 years ago, before women had the right to vote, before the germ theory of disease was widely accepted. It starts at zero weeks, has no exceptions for rape or incest or the health of the mother. Dan Kelly absolutely would have affirmed that abortion ban if he were on the state Supreme Court. Janet Protasiewicz has been very clear. She won't prejudge a case, but her view is that abortion is a decision that should be left up to the person whose body is affected. So this was a central issue for people of all generations. We had a huge surge in youth turnout. This was a, a, an issue that motivated a huge gender gap, but also enraged men who don't want to see uh, people that they love and people in their communities endangered and threatened and restricted and unfree because of this ban. But even though two thirds of Wisconsinites oppose the abortion ban, the state legislature dominated through this Republican gerrymander refused to do anything about it. The governor called for a special session to repeal it. They gaveled in and gaveled out within a few seconds. It was a slap in the face to the Wisconsin public, and the Wisconsin public fought back.